Good morning, Dr. Reinegard. How's it going? It's going well. How how does it uh, how does my voice sound for you? It's perfect. Excellent. Well, the staff here has uh, placed uh, a microphone right next to my phone, and uh, they can hear you. Yes. Oh, good. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thanks for letting me join you this way. I appreciate it. <laughs> What's your location on either 77 or 37? Uh, I'm on, uh, I'm almost to Mathis. Ah. Mathis Kidmore. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we, we are ready to go now that we're all here. We have the MACA students. We have the students from um, from the Harlingen School of Health Professions. There are three students that I'll, I'll mention in a minute who helped us out with the focus groups. Jenny's here from UCD. Principal Garza is here from Harlingen School of Health Professions. Brianna is here representing public relations. And um, we are ready to go. So. I was going to ask if you can start with a few remarks to start off, and um, and then we can proceed with the presentation. Great. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm certainly with an esteemed group there. I wish I was there in person with all of you, but I'm I'm really glad we are together. Um, you know, this is this is a really exciting process. I think we're in in terms of you know building a new a new intervention, thinking about ways to address issues that are important to our community. And so it, for me, one of the most exciting parts about it is because we have student involvement. And so, you know, the, the students there are the VIPs, in my opinion, so I think that's great. Um, and, and so um, Mr. Torres has put together, I think, a really good presentation to summarize where we are in this process and where we want to go. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna kind of listen, and I may jump in a little bit if I can't keep my mouth shut. But I hope it's really a, a dialogue uh, throughout the whole thing. And um, you know, the partnership between the district and the university and, of course, the Unido Santa de Diabetes is so important. So, that's it for me. Um, so, the ball, I'm going to turn it to you and I'll, I'll just kind of mute and listen in for a while, okay? Very good, Dr. Reininger. Thank you for <laughs> making this extra effort to join us and guiding us throughout this project. I mean, she, uh, Dr. Reininger is a member of the steering committee for Unidos Contra la Diabetes, but she wears so many hats in her professional uh, world and in the education world, of course, being one of your trustee members. So we're very grateful that you took the time to um, guide us with this project and really till the end here, guide us to, to an, a s successful execution, which is where we're headed uh, with this campaign. Um, we are um, we're very pleased to be at this point uh, not at the tail end of the project, we're sort of at the middle of the project and in the presentation in a few minutes you'll get to see kind of like a, 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 uh, a layout of where the campaign started and where we're going and where you all fit in as students and as members of the Harlingen uh, school community. Uh, this campaign that we're talking about is a public awareness campaign, but it's a, it's a change campaign. It's a, it's a campaign uh, where we're all joining our forces, our different expertise, our different um, um, interests in better public health so that we can actually influence in a very positive way what kinds of decisions people make about their consumption of beverages, in this case, sugary beverages. Uh, this is actually a topic that is, it can be very controversial depending on how you work on it. And in other ways, it can be very educational and informative. Our effort here is the latter, so that this campaign is one about us as, as professionals, as educators, administrators, as students, doing our part to educate our community, which is the Rio Grande Valley, about this issue. And we didn't want to do this because we think we have the answers. We really wanted to do this because we want to know where the community is with our knowledge of this topic, and then what are we gonna do to kind of fill in the gaps of understanding of what impact these decisions have 
uh, with, uh, with beverages. What, what I'm going to do today with Dr. Reininger's assistance and, and, G and Jenny Newcomb is here, uh, Executive Director of Unidos, she's going to chime in when I fail to mention something critical about our collaborative. Dr. Reininger used a word that is very key to this whole thing. She used the word partnership. This is something that's very, very interesting to underline because we all are so darn busy and we all sometimes tend to just gear toward our silo, even within an institution. This department does this, this department does this, you do this. And outside in the real world, this organization does this, this organization does this. Everybody kind of in their own world, in their own silos. We're kind of shattering that um, mindset so that we can break down some of those um, some of those lines so we can see how do we leverage each other's strengths. So partnership is a very good word because that's what we used in order to come up with this campaign to develop it and then to execute it. So having said that, uh, we know that the purpose of the campaign was education. We know it was about awareness and specifically it was about consumption of beverage, uh, sugary beverages, soda being the principal type of beverage that we were very interested in seeing what is the valley population, um, what is their behavior, what is the consumption patterns with it, what do they know about it. We did this campaign, as I mentioned earlier, about awareness, but awareness about what? We're not biased one way or the other, it's more of what, what do we do to inform the public about this topic. We know that soda consumption is detrimental to health and well-being. It, there's a lot of documentation of it. Um, your parents will probably tell you, if you simply ask them, uh, your primary doctor will tell you that there's plenty of literature that ties excessive consumption of sugary beverages to risk of stroke and heart disease. And of course, uh, the onslaught of diabetes in, pe in, in, in individuals. The obesity, obesity risk for all of us rises dramatically when you add to your diet an excessive amount of these sugary beverages. We, do, we also have learned from the literature, and some of it is noted here by some Rice University students that did some analysis for this project. Uh, they found documentation that consumption of sugary beverages does decrease over, over, over the decades. That sounds good, right? on first blush, um, and that's part of the impetus here. So if people are drinking it really early, early on, like in their teens and 20s, those are the red flags. Are they really drinking more than the older uh, uh, decades? And the answer we found out is yes. This is a, this is a problem. We found in this um, source that 71% of individuals between the ages of 14 and 19 drink soda. They, they drink it, yes, and many drink excessive amounts that is uh, not recommended and as you again as you go up above 30 years old you see that the rate goes down to 50 and you'll see that the results of the focus groups um, match or mirror this finding so that's why we're focused on the youth the younger brackets of our, um, our, our population so um, a lot of smart people in this room and we want to go out there and start telling people Drink more water, drink less soda. It's good for you, it's bad for you. We want to start doing that. I mean, that's just the, you want to go to the next family gathering and become very unpopular and start telling folks, drink more water. You want to do that. But uh, as I've been taught in working for UT Health School of Public Affairs or School of Public Health, you need data. You need to explain it with actual data from the community. It can't just come from what we think is the uh, status of our population. So under Dr. Reiniger's direction, uh, we developed a focus group um, tool or method to uh, basically survey the population. That tool specifically asked people in English and Spanish such basic questions about their consumption patterns. But we first had to create strategically the categories of focus groups that would capture this data. So we did it by age. We, we did uh, three categories, uh, 14 to 19, 20 to 30, and 31 to 40. By gender, by geographic location, that's really important because we're, this is not a focus group for Brownsville, not a focus group for 
uh, Westlaco or McAllen. This is for the Rio Grande Valley. So we did our best to get representation from across the valley. And the materials that were produced took a while to get produced. Um, and you know, I come from a policy background where there's a problem, there's an issue, and you move on it. Here, you needed to take your time to create documents that were unbiased. Nothing on there could indicate a bias one way or the other. The wording, the layout, everything had to show objectivity so that the participants wouldn't be affected by the, the, uh, the way the materials were presented. So the materials were produced in English and Spanish. Questions were very um, unbiased. And the folks that were trained uh, were trained to be unbiased and very objective in how they did that. Uh, we're very pleased to inform you that four members of your school district uh, were trained in this focus group facilitation and became professional facilitators as a result of this three-hour training that they attended in, uh, in Westlaco. Uh, your principal, uh, Principal Tina Garza from Harlingen School of Health Professions, was there getting trained, and she brought along three excellent students who got trained also that morning to be facilitators and note takers. We had Adrián Garcia, we had Nia Cerda, and we had Adriana Pacheco. All four got trained and are now certified by UCD to be facilitators and future recruits for other focus groups. <laughs> but uh, we, so we were very happy that your school district um, offered to, to not only get um, trained in this, but also contribute your time. Well, we know that took a lot of time out of your school day and I hope from what you see today it was a good investment of your time. And they're here today, so we're very pleased that they're here. Mm -hmm. um, why should we conduct this campaign? Why should it not be the school district? Why should it not be the city of Harlingen or, or um, another group? Well, there's, there's a logic here to why we partnered. And we being our collaborative itself, which is headed by uh, Jenny Newcomb, this collaborative represents a broad array of organizations from around the valley, education, um, local um, school districts, higher ed, higher education, community-based groups that work in the colonias, that work in some of the, in, in different cities, working on community development, very broad collaborative. And we do something that's very rare, is we, we actually meet and we actually do consensus um, building among us as to how we're going to work on different areas. This area of awareness and policy is just one, one of many areas we work on. Now, the School of Public Health is a fantastic uh, uh, capacity builder in our community. This is an example of it. Here you had Dr. Reininger volunteer her time and, and her staff to provide us support in, in all aspects of this project. Um, they're not just educators. They are community builders. And so we were very pleased to have this uh, partnership come together for this. Guess what? As awesome as we are, we cannot do it all. That is one of the lessons of collaborative building in our area. We had to ask for a lot of help. Uh, that morning when you all were there in Westlake getting trained, you, there were about 20, 22 people being trained and there were different organizations uh, represented. All of these organizations that you see on this slide volunteered their time, their location, members of their constituencies, and you can see it's pretty broad. We had a local government support with a focus group. We have you all from the Harlingen School District here. We had about three or four <coughs> groups that work with immigrants and community-based groups at like Lupe, Proyecto Juan Diego, Proyecto Azteca, Arise. We had the University School of Medicine provide one of their statisticians or researchers to help us conduct focus groups. And we had uh, Valley Baptist conduct a focus group out of their Brownsville uh, site. So it was a nice mix of professionals and entities lending not only their support but their people from their from their um, from their universe or community, whether it was patients or or participants in programs. The this is a breakdown of how we were very um, careful to divide up the group so that we had good representation uh, from all levels. As you can see, we split up the, we, we aimed to have 12 focus groups. We were able to do 10, 
we had a difficult time getting, no surprise, <coughs> men to participate in, in focus groups. So we tried very hard to get 12. We came, came up with 10 for a good sample of 100 participants. This is a really good, uh, Dr. Reiniger can tell us if I'm exaggerating, but I believe this is a pretty reasonable pool of uh, participants for a project like this. The Absolutely. Oh. Right. Typically, you have four to six focus groups, so to have ten is a is a very um, robust number of groups and gives us more in depth information. Awesome. Thank you. As you can see, we split up the groups, the ten focus groups, by uh, gender and language. You can see the column here, half and half. Um, the first four groups is the 14, the 19. The uh, next four is the 31 to 40, excuse me, the 20 to 30, and the last two are the 31 40. By county, we did a pretty good job of broad representation. We had almost evenly split between Cameron and Hidalgo County. We had one Willacy, which was Suplinica site over there, did one focus group. And I came that close to getting one focus group out of Star County, that close. Uh, we're going to get them for the next round of focus groups as the campaign grows. But this is pretty good. This, is, this means we had reviews from across the region, and that made us, as, as the conveners of this, feel more satisfied with the, the broad representation. Now what I'm going to present to you is something that uh, Dr. Reininger arranged. She arranged for over spring break for uh, 12 uh, Rice University students who were here for spring break. They opted, instead of going out to um, a spring break resort, they opted to stay here in the, in the valley and with the UT School of Public Health and do a project. And one of the projects they were assigned during spring break was given the results of all the focus groups. You know, the materials like this thick with all the surveys and, and notes that were put together. They took that material during spring break and they analyzed it and they came up with a number of, of uh, findings regarding what was said in the uh, focus group results. Twelve students, I mean, that this, it, was, it was a pretty formidable group. You should have seen them. They were working into the night uh, so that they could get this analysis done and they did an excellent job uh, for that. I think most of the students were science, pre-med, so it was, a, it was a group that was good. They were getting exposed to a policy area where they may not be in policy themselves in the future, but they were attuned to this aspect of their future work. So with the next uh, five or six slides, I'm going to scroll through them rather quickly and just point out a few highlights from them. Um, first, we see examples of sugary beverages. Almost everybody, of course, mentioned soda, as you can see. Fruity drinks were very popular by brand name and also just the description of them. And coffee, coffee was mentioned a lot. This is interesting because a lot of young people drink coffee. But from, I mean, again, this could take another focus group just to focus on, on the type of beverages. But coffee showed up quite a bit uh, among all the 10 focus groups. And we're thinking it's because of how many varieties of coffees are being offered at retail establishments. And so people are starting to ask for more variety of that particular beverage. Um, as you can see, some of the sm other categories that were mentioned, like energy, energy, energy drinks, dairy, which does, is, is, is in this category, especially when it's flavored with uh, added sugar. Uh, that was mentioned as well. Um, here we have, why are people drinking sugar beverages? This is proof that the beverage companies are definitely doing their work effectively because the number one reason uh, was taste. This is why they drink the beverage. Um, that was just a very strong response across the board, meaning that that's going to continue to be a reason why there's a heavy um, uh, preference for the sugary beverages because they've just gotten used to that taste. And the market keeps experimenting with different ways to make that taste even better. How sugary drinks affect health? This is a way, how do we gauge individuals? Now remember, the individuals that were in the focus groups were from students to um, adults who had very little education to some education. So it was, a, it was a mix, depending on which group was doing which focus group. There was a lot of 
really good insight into the health effects of the sugary um, beverage consumption. Not, a, not an overwhelming amount, but there was, you know, here and there people who had done some research on their own or they had read or heard enough about it that there were, yeah, there may be some connection here between sugary beverages and, um, and, 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 and chronic conditions, for example. As you can see, there a good healthy amount, 70% or 7 out of 10 mentioned obesity, overweight in the results of the focus groups. So that was good. There's some, there's some familiarity with that tie, okay? And metabolism, um, half of the focus groups mentioned that as one of the reasons um, or one of the effects of consuming sugary drinks. Why are people drinking or not drinking water? This was also a good finding as far as why are, why are people drinking or not drinking it? There's a lot of lack of knowledge of what water actually does to a body that's positive. And that was shown here. Uh, there, there, are, there is familiarity with that the body needs it and that there's a cleansing effect when you drink water. So it almost sounded like, well, if I need it, I'll drink it. It wasn't really a, this is part of my daily diet. It was more of like, well, you know, I kind of need it sometimes, so I'll drink it. That was sort of the, the message that comes across with this kind of, of finding. Health effects of water. Again, bodily functions was kept coming up uh, from people. It, it, it wasn't about um, a different way to improve your overall holistic wealth or, or your wellness. It was more about, well, I, I, I think my body needs it, so I'll, I'll consume it. What effects does drinking water or sugary beverages? Again, this kind of summarizes what uh, why would people drink one or the other environmental factors such as the external surroundings you know the family influence the influence at school a lot of these factors were the principal ones mentioned uh, for why people drink one or the other why do people drink diet beverages uh, trying to be healthy was the principal reason but it matched with external pressure because other people are doing it and, and that's, that's, a, that's a typical response. Now, the next, two, the next three slides kind of break down some of these findings. And I'm, I'm going to fly through them because I, I definitely want us to have some quality time to discuss the next steps. All right? Uh, this, this, um, this result here asked folks, there was one question, if you all recall, when you all did the surveys with your participants, was in the last two years, have you been drinking more or less of sugary beverages? Sugary beverages, that was the question. And the, the top answer was less, which sounds good, right? That's, that's promising. What's not promising is the third number, the third column. Third column says the same, meaning whatever I know or whatever I've known in the last two years, guess what? I still drink about the same. In other words, I haven't made a dramatic change. The good number is the first one. Low number, people have increased the number of sugary beverages that they consume. As you can see, there were 17 individuals saying that. But this third column is very disturbing. It's, it's troublesome because it means that with everything that we still know, that we know and we've been learning about sugary beverages, 35 of the individuals said, uh, you know, despite all that, I still drink about the same, which whatever level that is. And then, of course, 45 is a good trend um, for, for reducing um, consumption of sugary beverages. Now, let's compare that to, to, to water. Oh, before we compare to water, this is why it's troubling, this, this outcome. Okay? This breaks down, and Dr. Reininger was on point here, that we look at this by age group. Uh, and then how does this compare to what the earlier slide that I showed you about how we drink more sugary earlier? Okay, this verifies that academic finding. Here you can see that from 14 to 19, these four focus groups that were done, and your students did three of them, the, the largest number was 21 uh, that they drink less, but 13 of those are drinking less. So about 30, 31% are still despite everything they know, and despite everything you're telling them at school about nutrition and about proper um, 
a way to hydrate and so on. 31% are still just maintaining the same pattern. That's not a good trend for that age group because they're paying attention and, they're, and students are more attuned to what's being said in the, in the social media and, 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 and in your learning environment. For the 20 to 30, same trend here. And as Dr. Reininger pointed out, these categories show definitely worse than average for where we want to be. And then you look at the older uh, category, 3140, which is still a young category, but we've, we did some analysis of them to see where their patterns are, and their patterns are going down a consumption, but it's still, it's still too much. Water. This one was of great interest to, of great interest, interest to us to have, which is one question on the survey was, how many glasses of water do you drink in a day? Okay, the good and the bad. The good is that people are drinking water, and this shows that, okay? It shows you one to, f one to three ounces is what people marked, 44. So that was, that's good. So people are drinking water. And there were, you know, the four that you see over here on the far left column, these are people who just sat out right in their survey. We don't drink any. We don't drink any, and we don't care to. That, that's, that's that part, category, you know, to to be concerned about. The, the last two categories show there's a, there's a good amount of people who are drinking a little bit more, and then over six, that, that's kind of a, a good finding as well. But the 44, focus on that one. Now, you've been told, all of us have been told, that we're supposed to hydrate all day, right? One to three does not hydrate you all day. That's, I mean, you're, you happen to catch some water, that equals to one to three ounces. That's the highest category in this finding. This tells me that people may be familiar with why it's important to drink water, but they're not drinking the recommended amount of water. So this is something that tells us that the campaign is even more timely when you're gonna do a campaign to uh, promote drinking more, drinking less sugar beverages. The alternative is water. This tells you we have some work to do with um, the younger categories of the population. And everybody's looking at themselves like, oh, how much did I drink yesterday? All right. Now, let's go into what we did about this as far as the purpose of the focus groups. We, the, our, our staff are um, at the um, Dr. Reininger's um, um, school, in conjunction with UCD through our working group, we came up with eight logos to kind of give a variety of ways to do a public message. And this is what the focus groups were each asked to give feedback on. All of these were thoroughly reviewed by each focus group in English and Spanish. And uh, uh, what I'm gonna show you in a minute is the result of the one that got the most vote from the 10 focus groups. Everybody in the focus group, by the way, got a vote. It wasn't just like the, the group voting. It was more of a, everybody had an individual view that was documented. As you can see, the logo theme about life is sweet enough was a very, it was a catchy phrase, and that's what we're going to go with. What I'm going to show you now is the visual of the logo that got the most support. First, before we go into that winning logo or the selected logo, this is important if you're going to work on developing ads for this campaign. Dr. Reininger pointed out that it's important to see what were the attributes of those that were not selected, the, you know, the seven that were not selected as the top vote getter. Well, these are the types of positive attributes in some of these seven. It's important to keep this if you're going to be working on either radio ads, TV ads, social media ads. It's important that you keep these because these are points that you can um, incorporate into your work. And I won't read them all here, but this gives you uh, a nice overview of where the message was clear, understandable. That scored a lot. It, it, it kept mention, being mentioned in both English and Spanish, if the message was clear and, and catchy. There were a lot of negative attributes of the seven, a lot of them. And we included them all so that, again, we try not to repeat these. That was the purpose of this. This is as... Uh, informative as why the, the, the number, the, the selected one was selected. 
there were people uh, commenting how it reminded them of certain products out there, not good, right? Um, the font was not good. It was an eye-catching. Um, I'm telling you, there was a lot of sophisticated views in the focus groups about fonts and about the image versus the text. I mean, people were getting really scientific about how it was being laid out. So um, t t that summarizes them. This is the results. Now, if these results had been really, really close, we would be a little nervous. We'd say, uh-oh, what, what do we do now? Because, you know, two logos or three logos all scored really high. Um, fortunately, we don't have that. We have a situation here where without each focus group knowing how the other focus group voted, uh, the number four logo scored the highest, meaning the, the 10 focus groups, that one got the most votes. And even within each focus group, when they picked logo four, it was like the, almost the majority picked it. So we were very confident with, with this outcome. Here's the winner. Oh, I hope it didn't disappear. There. You like my fancy animation? The, this is a, oh, you missed the fireworks uh, outside, um, Dr. Reininger. We have fireworks go outside right now when I showed the winning logo. <laughs> that was the animation. <laughs> That's right. This is, this is the winning logo. This is the one that got the most support. And these are the attributes of that logo. A lot of these were repeated quite a bit. It's, it's actually a shorter list than the others because a lot of these were repeated by, the, by focus groups. So that was another indicator that we had um, a very good uh, selection here. And I, these attributes here for these two slides are broken down into what did you like about this logo? You know, the physical aspect of it. But then also Dr. Reininger suggested you also want to know when you do these focus groups how, do you, how does something make you feel? So we asked that question. How do you feel when you look at this logo? And you ask people that question, and they actually have a lot of feedback. And so they mentioned things like, yeah, it makes me want to drink water. Um, boy, it reminds me how much I'm not drinking of water. Uh, blue, they love the blue. The blue, blue, blue. It was just positive. It just made you feel refreshed. And so these attributes here we have to maintain in the ads both verb uh, both in in, um, in through mass communications and through printed and social media these attributes are very important to maintain not to lose them because they reflect what the population is reacting to remember the focus groups are a reflection of what the population is going to react to when the message is done these are um, oh, these are additional points, takeaway points, that were um, um, submitted by Dr. Reininger. These are really, really strong points. She's pointing out that, um, unfortunately, people still did not see sports drinks as sugary. That's of concern because in the younger age brackets, that's taken more as a, as a daily intake beverage versus a luxury, you know, once in a while beverage. It's more like a water. <laughs> And that one was still not seen. Ooh, I lost her. I hope she didn't hit an armadillo. <laughs> that means she's passing Pleasanton. She's passing... Uh, she was in Mathis. I think she hit Pleasanton by now. Oh, right? A lot of hills? That's her battery at the hills. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just hit a dead spot. <laughs> no problem. We thought it was a bad spot or an armadillo. <laughs> there you go. There you go. We, we also, Dr. Reininger also pointed out that uh, from the results of the focus groups, we can make the conclusion that still folks, not enough folks, do not understand that sugary beverages are related to obesity. Something that may seem common sense to us, but there's still not a lot of common uh, uh, knowledge that this is connected to this. All right? Um, 
Many did not take the connection between drinking water and sugar reduction. And the myth is still out there that diet soda is okay. You can drink as much of it as you want. It's, it's the best alternative if you're being told not to drink too much soda. That's a myth. And that's something that we have to, um, we have to confront as we encourage people to drink more water. They may just rebel and say, no, just drink diet soda. Bad move. And that came across in the results. So, where are we? Where have we been and where are we going? Um, if we were funded by um, a major funder for this campaign, and they said to me, Salomon, what do you need? Um, what kind of team do you need to put together to make this campaign happen so that this goes out in the Rio Grande Valley this summer or, or sooner? Well, we would need to collect data, we would need to do data analysis, we would need to create marketing products, and then of course we're going to launch. Well, this is volunteer driven. This is groups, partners coming together. And so what we've done is um, you've, you've been part of the first phase, which is the data collection for the focus groups. That's the, that's the insight, the raw data we need in order to us to go forward with confidence and with a straight face, now raise the resources that we need to have a, a full campaign. The data analysis was done by the Rice University students in conjunction with our office and also with Dr. Reininger and her, her team. This is the next step, and this is where you all come in. As students, particularly from the Media and Arts Communication Academy and from the School of Health Professions, we need to produce material, marketing material, that is going to relay the message. And I'll go through some ground rules in a minute, but let me, let me just um, make this comment here. The, the marketing products that you're gonna come up with, this is your opportunity to make them as real world as possible. This is not a class exercise where you will be graded and it ends there. No, this is going to be the material that we will use for this public campaign in the Rio Grande Valley that's gonna reach thousands and thousands of people. That's why we're doing the campaign. This is not about changing one individual or one family at a time. This is about a broad message that in one swoop, whether it's through a social media banner ad or a billboard or at the football game this fall, you know, messages up on the scoreboard, this is gonna hit people in one shot. So the material you come up with has a lot writing on it, all right? So no pressure to create material that is on point, positive, and that's going to produce the intended outcome, which is going to make people think about what they're consuming and what exactly is the issue with sugar beverages. Now, for this open discussion that we have a remaining uh, 15 minutes, um, a few points. As you work on the ads, your universe of templates should not be just what we came up with for the final logo. The final logo should be the core message, the core colors, the core presentation. But it is not what we're going to uh, place on an ad and make that the social media ad or the billboard ad or the TV ad or a saver uh, in, in, in media formats. This is, you will have ample opportunity on your own to do research with other media campaigns that were done so that you can see how other folks took on this challenge, which is to educate the public. Others <coughs> were a little bit more aggressive and actually showed uh, other products. Others were more emphasis on drinking water and they were very explicit about it. They said it, right? We kind of took the middle ground. We, as you notice our winning ad, in true consensus building um, um, tradition, we kind of went in the middle. We didn't say don't drink a brand or don't drink uh, a juice drink or a soda drink. We said, you know what, think about it. Uh, our drinks don't have to be any sweeter than what we have now. Here, we're not saying very aggressively drink water or else. We're saying think about it. Think about what it means to consume what you consume. You notice this slide here. We went to some campaigns around the country 
And that gives you some examples of how people were educating the public. These are not an endorsement of those ads. This is just samples of how you could lay out the winning ad. Also, keep in mind, we don't want you to be limited by, you know what, I don't know how much money they really have to do an ad. Uh, we want you to be very creative. I want you to pretend that Melinda Gates came to us and said, oh, just, we'll cut the check. Just give us what it costs to do a full-blown Rio Grande Valley campaign in phases. So I don't want you to limit yourself to just social media ads. Do a template for what a good primetime TV ad would, would, would charge. Uh, how much would a full page ad in the Valley Morning Star, the Monitor and the Bronzeville Herald would cost? Or, or uh, how would it look? We, we, we want you to be that, that open and creative. We want the ads to be in English and Spanish. You all were excellent with your Spanish fluency. This is the opportunity for you all and your colleagues to continue practicing um, the use of Spanish in communications for, for these ads. And a few uh, ground rules, which is going to affect your final layouts. We don't want to promote straws, the use of straws, and we don't want to promote the use of bottles, meaning um, uh, plastic bottles. That opens up another can of worms as far as people getting distracted by the message. So even though the winning ad or logo has a plastic bottle, we're going to ask you to be creative in what type of container you would use to still get the message across and the, the message still about what you consume as far as drinks. And another ground rule, do not go after any brand, any of them, by name, um, especially by name, so that we can stay moderate, stay informative. Um, now, does it mean that we will not get approached by certain industries about what exactly are you trying to do here? And actually, I'm going to welcome, we're going to welcome that type of inquiry from industry, um, from the sugary beverages industry, because it opens up dialogue about, you know, what this product is contributing to the health condition of our population. Ah, that's what the last point means. That don't, um, we're intending here to create uh, education in the community, but also to bring out a reaction from industry and also from communities that now are going to want to get involved. When they start seeing the first ad out there, people are going to come out of the woodwork and say, whoa, how do we get involved with this? You know, our focus is children. How, how, do, we, how do we now amend our strategy to add your, 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 your theme here? Um, there's going to be different angles that are going to come to us. Um, I'm, I'm getting ready to close down, Dr. Reiniger, just for open discussion here, if there's any points that the students want to bring up. Is there anything you'd like to add before we do that? Uh, only, and, and you may have mentioned it, and I missed it, uh, but that the focus, we really would like the focus of the campaign to be for those individuals 30 and younger. And we know that's still a very broad segment of the population, and part of what's important is segmentation, and that's not narrowing it down very much. But um, 30, you know, so design it so that it would reach that, that age group. Like the, the, the um, focus groups kind of were 14 and older, um, but in the work it looks like, you know, 30 to 14 is kind of your, your population. Very good. Are there any additional points or observations or reflections that you all would want to would wanna share? The only thing that I kind of saw whenever we were going through the slides, mm -hmm. uh, while we were comparing the, the 14 to 19 focus group um, results, is that it said that 31.9% of, I, I believe I'm correct, 31.9% mm -hmm. um, of the students reported that they were drinking just as much uh, sugary beverages. However, what I was thinking there is that um, if you compare Harlingen to the rest of the valley, how would that number be placed compared to another district or another community that is predominantly Hispanic mm -hmm. compared to Harlingen, which has kind of a different, different mix, ethnic, mm -hmm. ethnic kind of pop population. Mm -hmm. And what I was thinking as well is that um, just because of everything that we learn through every day um, at our school where we learn about biology and the effects of, of, of drinks and the derogatory causes that it, that it has on our bodies and all of that. 
how would that number differ from one of the comprehensive high schools yes. where they don't have that much awareness for health and, and uh, for, for everyday uh, learning, um, how, how those kind of things affect our body. So that's what I was thinking. That's a really good point because your population already was, by definition, geared more toward understanding health. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. It may mean that the numbers are, are worse. Mm -hmm. That's but, what I was yeah. kind of thinking. Um, so, so even with the strength of three of the focus groups being your student population, there's still work to be done. So it's, it's, uh, that's a good footnote for our, for our final report to include, to include that observation. Thank you. Any other? Yes, ma'am. Um, I was going to ask, is this going to be a 30-second video or a 60-second video ad? And when the deadline is going to be? Sure. Uh, it's leaning toward um, a 30-second. So for, for, more, for more hits, you know, mm -hmm. to stay on it, uh, I would gear toward, toward the 30. Uh, as far as when, I am going to defer to really the, the timeline that you all have for the remainder of the school year, which, which I know is very tight. Uh, we, of course, will welcome any help during the summer, but ideally we would ask you to focus on this so that by the time the school year is over, you've produced a few products uh, that we'd be able to then place. That's, that's the... And if I could mm -hmm. add a little bit on the timeline in terms of not the final deadline, but in terms of communicating back with our UCD uh, partnership, we will meet again. We have a meeting this week with them. We'll apprise them of what happened today and let them know the progress that's going to be made over the next you know, four to six weeks. And then on the 22nd of May, we gather again. So that is an opportunity. If you have something drafted and ready to present, we would love to be able to present them with something on that day. And, and we would invite you, those meetings are during the day. It's uh, May the 22nd. It's a Wednesday. The meeting goes from 9 to about 11.30. So we would invite you to be present um, and share, share what you have um, if you're able. And, and I also would add, do not wait until uh, then yes. to <laughs> show us what you have. Yes, definitely. If, you, if, you get in, in, if you get really inspired and create, create something this week, uh, this is our contact information, which I ask you to take a picture of. Well, you have the PowerPoint, but... Take a picture of it so you know where to reach Dr. Reininger and myself um, at any time. And we'll give you feedback as you go along, whatever it is. That way you can feel. I think feel. it would be great to have a, like a weekly update uh, just to be, to be aware of where the, where the project is going and, and if there's any specific questions mm -hmm. that, that the students have as they're working on this that we can do a check-in, whether it's a call or or something just to do a check-in if that's if that meets with everybody's schedule or every two weeks I know it's it's the end of the school year so it's gonna fly pretty fast from here and Miss Guajardo with the media students um, I'll defer to you to guide them on um, like when you place an ad in a certain kind of media form um, what do they require you know the format the size of it and so on I'll defer to you, but if you need any kind of assistance, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to, to, to connect with an actual media placement, okay, okay? to do that. But, but you, I, you probably do that better than I do uh, with your, with your uh, preparation, no. okay? Yeah, but we're going to try to get these out before the 17th. Um, they, uh, the last week of May, the seniors are going to be going to different presentations and stuff because, of course, they have to get, um, they'll be graduating, and so the schools have so many meetings for them to attend throughout the day. So I'm going to, we're, we'll, we're going to try to get this done beforehand and um, try to get you, you know, several samples to go, you know, different ones to choose from. And again, you know, when they, you know, get with y'all, meet with y'all, don't feel like you're going to offend them by any means. They know that they need to, you know, to the client, they want to make the client happy. 
And so whatever revisions, they welcome it. So awesome. And of course, we're always open for further dialogue and collaboration with okay. the elevator. Awesome. Thank yes. you so much. Is there anything else? Speak now. <laughs> you have the team here. Yeah. Yes. Just so very grateful. I mean, I think it comes across from Salomon and from, from Dr. Reiniger, but on behalf of all of our partners with UC, so very grateful for your time and effort in helping us understand uh, what the focus groups were wanting to communicate to us and helping us get that information to our um, group and then in helping us take, help, help it take shape. It's, a, it's been a complete volunteer effort. Um, it'll be exciting to report back to the community um, everybody's contribution and just how hard everybody has brought their um, their work to bear and their their knowledge and their expertise. So, so just in advance, thank you. If I don't get to tell you in person again, Dr. Reininger, would you like to make a another remark bef before I make a final remark? I, I just wanted to say how excited I am that that the students will be involved in this and are and to Ms. Lajardo for, for allowing this to be part of their learning ex experience and, and certainly a learning experience for all of us as well. So I, I truly appreciate that and I'm excited about the, the opportunity and the results. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dr. Reininger. Um, hope you have a good visit to San Antonio and thank you for making this effort to be with us as you travel up there. And thank you. And um, to the Public Relations Department, Brianna, please extend our thank you to, to Shane for setting this up and to you for receiving us and taking care of our, of our setup here. And to the students, we look forward to keep working with you. Ms. Mm -hmm. Guajardo, ever, ever since I toured with Shane your facility, um, I got giddy about what was possible here. Uh, and, and now we're going to put it to practice. And, and so for a very good cause. So thank you, thank you for that. Well, that, that concludes our presentation. Um, we look forward to being in touch with you as we get ready to launch uh, phase one, and uh, we'll stay in touch as we, as we continue the work. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.